artists interview artists and where you're talking about the things that no journalist would ever right. ask. Like how do you actually do what you do? Like that's what I want to know when I'm when I'm hearing somebody talk about their work. Right. And and the interesting thing about it is that all the the explanations are never direct. I mean they are but but they can also be abstractions, right? Because you live in a lot of ways. I mean it's like okay, well, <clears throat> you know, do you want to learn how to do 100 push-ups here? Start with 10. Yeah. And then eventually you'll get to a hundred. See you guys. Okay. <laughs> right, so I guess we're talking. Yeah. You know, but but you know when you talk about the energy from your finger going into the string and then coming back into your body. Yeah. How's a journalist understand that? Yeah. They can write it down. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I I would personally. I'm still. I think I'm still a young rebel. And I, I just don't care if they understand. Yeah. I would still say it if it's important. Yeah, I'm not, not trying to censor myself, you know. Like, and, it, and I know I mean, there's there are a lot of uh, potential uh, misunderstandings if you're like that. But I mean, if I'm like that. Mm -hmm. But it's like, I'd rather be authentic. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like if you, yeah. you know, if you're, if you're not allowed to use the language that you want to use, then what's the point of, of 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 talking? Yeah. So this actually, this actually touches back on something we were talking about earlier, which is kind of just being in the world. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, as an artist, you're in the world. All you really want is to be able to express your art and have people listen and appreciate it. The people that want to hear it, right? Yeah. I mean, people that aren't interested, that's fine, right? Yeah. I mean, you yeah. know. But the world is big enough that if you have something to say that's worth saying, people, there are people who will want to hear it and respond to it. Exactly. I have the same feeling that I, if there's something that I can imagine that I want to hear, right. for example, it does not feel like that's that's just me. It feels like I'm part of a group who wants to hear that, right. and I have the I have the motivation to actually do it. You know, I'm the one who actually right. creates the sound, <laughs> but that does not mean that others are not thinking about the same thing. Right, and they want and somehow like my my career and like just the the way that my um, uh, like like the, the more and more I have new friends. Uh, fans, yeah. friends. Um, it, the more it shows that they're looking for the same thing, right? And I'm just one of the guys who actually goes a bit further, not just dreams about it, but actually does it, right? So and I think you you need to connect with with that's kind of your tribe in a way. I think so. Yeah. But like you were saying, you know, when you're expressing yourself, it doesn't matter, kind of what the receptors are doing because as you're kind of broadcasting there's always because we have to broadcast we don't have like this kind of inborn kind of editorial thing where the perfect fan or the perfect appreciator of music is going to walk in the door mm -hmm. right they're, they're mm -hmm. going to discover you somehow like we talked about mm -hmm. or you know they're mm -hmm. going to discover music or even as listeners we do that right mm -hmm. we do the same thing um, but Along the path, you're going to have people walk in the room and go, what the hell is this shit? <laughs> you know? And they don't appreciate it. And in fact, because of the way that the culture is and the internet and everything else, there's a negative energy associated with that that can be pretty strong. Right? So I don't know if you've experienced that's that true. directly. That's true. I mean, but that's just like, if, if people are like that, then they don't have manners. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I seriously think. Yeah. They don't have manners. I can accept if you don't like something. And I can accept that, but if you if you kind of you know can hurt somebody else because he likes something right. that you don't like, then that's like where it ends for me. I remember one situation where my one of my best friends mm -hmm. at his thirtieth uh, birthday, long time ago, we were listening to David Sylvian in his living room, and one of his friends, female friends, came in the room. And she said, 
uh, turn of that funeral music. Mm -hmm. And that was like, that was shocking to me. It was actually eye opening, uh, eye opening to experience this, right. that there is a, a friend of my friend and they were, f they were friends, right. but she had no sense what that music meant to him. Right. And she said, turn out the funeral music. And that was just so incredible. It's, you know, that's, well, that's, you know, this is this, I, I don't know. I don't necessarily wrestle with this, but I, I do notice it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it bothers me about the world in general, you mm -hmm. know, that there's mm -hmm. less, less and less acceptance and openness, even mm -hmm. at the same time that there's a broader field for things to take place, mm -hmm. you know, so I don't know, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, the question is really why, why is that? And I, I think it's, it's partially maybe even even an under misunderstanding for on our side. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, wow, what's that? Car alarm. Yeah. Anyway, um, you know, there's, there's, um, you know, there are a lot of people who actually develop an interest for something, mm -hmm. who really fall in love with a certain idea, a certain concept. Could be music, could be art, could be sports, mm -hmm. um, cars. Right. Hi-fi systems, whatever. There's always like something that people kind of enjoy as their hobby or whatever. But there also seems to be um, people who don't have anything like that, mm -hmm. who just seem to be like empty. Um, and I'm, I'm not even judging this, that this as something uh, bad, really, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't really know. I can't imagine what it must be like to not be not having ever um, developed a passion mm -hmm. and, um, or just and I'm, I'm, I'm actually doubting that it even exists that there's a, 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 a you know a human being without some sort of passion mm -hmm. or but a deep interest in something yeah but some people might maybe kind of bury that yeah. feeling or that interest deep inside and don't let it come out because of social pressure or whatever I don't know yeah I don't know either <coughs> um, I think you're right, though. I mean, it's it's impossible to imagine not having a deep interest in something. So maybe just people focus it in different ways. They focus it in, you know, family or social mm -hmm. environments, or you know, hopefully something positive. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. But it can also be very negative, right? Just mm -hmm. trolling on the internet or whatever, you know, or that's you know, it's, it's very easy to be negative, mm -hmm. you know, about anything, honestly. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, generally, I. I'm more of a uh, an optimist mm -hmm. than a pessimist. You know, I, does that actually exist in English? Optimist, pessimist. You say yeah, that? optimist, pessimist. Sure. Okay, because those are the German words, and sometimes I don't know if they translate yeah, exactly yeah. that way. Yeah, yeah. Those are the right. Ones. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I'm I'm actually an optimist. I I believe that that people are and humanity is getting better and better somehow. Mm -hmm. Like, if I'm if I'm looking at um, young young kids. Mm -hmm. Um, and compared to, you know, what I was capable of as a like ten year old, they lay, they live in a completely different world. They have a completely different understanding already. They they know how to use tools much better mm -hmm. than I did, and I think that's great. And and if if there's a way to challenge uh, channel channel that energy into um, something good, you know, I mean that's that's really it's wonderful. I think, and I'm curious <coughs> about your perspective on this because I, I think of it as there is a lot of, there's, just because of the evolution of people and societies and things, there's a lot of opportunities that didn't exist as we grew up. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it's always been, right? For every mm -hmm. generation that comes, there's different opportunities. But um, I see it kind of as a problem of scale. And maybe it's because of where I live here in Phoenix, um, and I'm curious about from where you live. but here in Phoenix, what's really interesting is the scale of the city. It's not a gigantic city. I mean, it's it's big, five million plus, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but what I find really fascinating about it is kind of the degree of opportunity and the and and you know, Phoenix has a lot of growth in the last ten, twenty years, and a lot of it is um, kind of at the lower end of the economic spectrum, where there's you know lots of 
people that have moved here because it's, it's cheap to live here and you know there's there's kind of jobs but they're not you know like if Amazon or Google comes to Phoenix is because they're gonna open a call center mm -hmm. you know they're not gonna do like advanced technology work mm -hmm. here or something mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so the kind of real big advances in opportunities for societies is not found at a scale in a town like this and if you go further and further out on on the edges of town and because we have a large um, you know Hispanic population immigrants and stuff and stuff where there's you know more and more depressed kind of uh, and this is a sort of a gross generalization but but just kind of there's more and more depressed economic areas where there's less and less opportunities and then there's political systems which want to keep it that way and you know schools and all this kind of stuff right so it's a scale thing so yeah <clears throat> there's kids in Scottsdale that have incredible opportunities or here in you know Mason Chandler and then there's kids in other parts of town that don't have anything you know and it's a big scale so I find myself waffling this is a long way of me saying I waffle between the optimism and the pessimism mm -hmm. because you can all it, it, it depends on the eye you put on this massive scale of stuff here's some good stuff here's some not so good stuff Mm. You know, which is which is the pervading force? Hey, if you if you have the choice, uh, then then go for the optimism. <laughs> there you go. Simple as that, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. It's good. <laughs> it's good. Yeah, seriously. I mean, there's there's no no need to be negative about anything. Yeah. And like, if if there's one thing that we can contribute, it's our goodwill. Uh, and for me, like optimism is kind of is part of that. Yeah, yeah, that's you know, great. I mean, yeah, maybe there's a kid from from um, a bad neighborhood, and you wouldn't expect that kid to be, um, I don't know, successful in life. That's just mm -hmm. you know to oversimplify things. But yeah, but but why not? I mean, believe. But I believe in that kid. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's that. That's what you have to do. And my, my brother actually works uh, in that field. He works as a kind of a social worker mm -hmm. and he works with kids. And I can, I can see how, how frustrated he is and he doesn't believe. He believes that like of like 200 kids that he works with, maybe one kid is going to change. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, he might actually be right with the numbers, but for me, um, that doesn't count. It's not the numbers. The fact that that one kid is actually gonna lead a good life. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I'm focusing on. You know, <laughs> there's still some hope there. Yeah, there's kind yeah. of a real. I mean, yeah, I mean, and, and there's an example. And it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't help. Right. To not be to not be positive. Right. right. I think that's really the uh, the crux of it. Is is kind of what's a useful thought and what's a not useful thought. Mm -hmm. It's a not. It's not useful. To think negatively, unless you're going, unless it's going to cause you to act differently, to change that, yeah, <laughs> you know. So why bother? Yeah. So this kind of loops back to that whole thing, like what you were saying with, you know, and people's judgment on music and and the music you do. I mean, sometimes I've had the feeling of, I've had, um, like, I don't want to play this music for some people because I because I don't want them to have that. What's this funeral music or what's that noisy mm -hmm. shit or whatever mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. It's like you almost want to go, well, you know, whatever, but then there's the other side of it, which is just to be authentic, as you said, and present it. And it's, I mean, it's not easy. It's, it's very hard to, to um, I mean, I, I know that I've, I've been called, like some people said I, that I'm autistic or something, <laughs> which is oh, ridiculous. God. It's the other way around. I mean... Like I could say, you are artistic mm -hmm. for saying that to me. Yeah. It's just that I'm, I've actually made a choice to uh, do what I do despite the fact that some people might not understand it. Mm -hmm. And I, I've accepted that as, as just a reality. And again, I'm not judging them and I'm not judging that, it, it, but, but yeah, it can, it, can, it can be hard. And I think you know, like in my career, which it's not really that long, I have to say, like mm -hmm. maybe maybe twenty years now. Uh, but I've had I've had like long stretches, like maybe five six years, where nothing happened, where I only got bad feedback. 
mm-hmm. and um, so and it's it's pretty hard to go through and just keep going. But I never had the choice to do anything else. Mm-hmm. Really, you just kind of believed in your your pursuit was purely based on that interest and desire to do it, right? Yeah, and and especially in the in. My interest was in discovering new sound worlds, mm-hmm. and like we said before, I, I think like if I can develop this interest and this hunger for that, there must be others. Right. And I mean, I, in even if there wouldn't be others, but there are. I, I kind of know it's like like. Actually, that is the great opportunity now, isn't it? Because you you know you can find those people eventually somehow. Yes, and and you know this idea of a collective subconscious, mm-hmm. um, it, it, it makes total sense. But I mean, the way that we need to look at it is ob- obviously there's something like, like a, like a um, I mean, it's always, ne- it's not necessarily a global selective mm-hmm. uh, uh, collective consciousness, but it's kind of localized um, s- spatially, but al- also localized in a field of interest. Mm-hmm. So in music, you have a certain you have certain people, you have a group of people who is interested in discovering a new sound world. Then you have other people who are interested in creating the best tools to be able to recreate the sound of the blues, for example. Mm-hmm. Or you know, like, but it's right. still it's still a discipline that's kind of at the same level as like founding a new sound right. world because because it's 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 about it's about creating the tools to to get where you want to be right and so somehow I I don't I don't make any like really distinction that the one thing isn't better than the other you know it's like it's 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 about this drive to to um, to create and it doesn't in the end the process is what counts so somebody who sits down and and tries to play like uh, I don't want to give a name now like play like somebody jazz guitars X <laughs> okay yeah um, has to spend as much time and energy to become that player as if I decide I want to sound like me, right? Or like this yeah. sound yeah. vision I have. Yeah. So, so in a way, what what really is connects us all uh, uh, is the process, right? And that's where we can share, no matter which field we're working in. Like if you're into in software development or in uh, Composition, music composition, or uh, running a business, mm-hmm. or you know, in a way, in the end, it it always come kind of comes down to the same uh, drive. Yeah, you know? yeah, it's got to be pure, authentic, and and come from a place that will keep you going forward. <laughs> yeah, you know, keep you moving. Um, you know, I'm curious because you said um, earlier you were saying you didn't really. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna blow this, but somehow you were saying that when you started, you didn't envision. It wasn't that you just wanted to get up and play. Mm-hmm. It's like you wanted to create the sound. You wanted to create the worlds that that yeah. you were hearing. You know, so you in order to do that, you <coughs> learned how to play. <laughs> but but I guess what I'm wondering is, um, what is your preferred mode? I mean, do, you know, when you're creating your own music, do, do you prefer to create just Solo, or do you like to work with other musicians, or how how do you approach this whole thing? What's your preferred sort of mode? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I I actually enjoy collaboration very much mm-hmm. because I I've somehow still had this belief that if you're working together, you create something that's bigger than the sum of its parts. Right. And especially if like creative minds get together. You can create something beautiful, yeah. and and it kind of contributes to, um, you know, like if you're looking for something new, if you're doing something new for yourself, if you want newer than new, work with somebody else, right, right, because there's always going to be more of a surprise factor, right. ideally, I'd right, say. okay, um, but I f- I found out that like um, working working solo, um, composing just on my own has um, has become more important in recent years mm-hmm. because I, I see that not having to make compromise and, I, and I've never never felt like 
I actually have to make a compromise when I work with somebody mm. else. But I figured that when I'm when I'm just make, taking just my own decisions and I'm completely left on my own, I create. I started creating something that really was. Um, and I don't, I don't even have words for it. But it had, it had m even, even more directness. And that, but that's a recent development in my, in my musical life, where I find that less, yes, now I have already uh, played on the field of collaboration mm -hmm. for long enough. Now mm -hmm. I can just be myself. And do you see the medium more as? I mean, is it a blend of live and recorded, or do you see it more as like, no, I just want to make these recordings and they'll live on and that kind of stuff? Uh, how do you? Yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, I mean, there there's so many modes I can go into. Yeah. Like for example, there's the mode of the of instant composition, mm -hmm. and I I pretty much enjoy that. Uh. But but then, um, ideally, I I even want to go beyond that, and that means that, um, the instant composition is not the end result but the I'm composing a process let's say and then I'm letting the process create the music mm -hmm. so I'm kind of inserting an additional a level like like writing an algorithm which creates a piece of music so my, my creativity goes into the algorithm mm -hmm. and then the algorithm spits out the music do you mean that literally I mean that li literally yeah yeah also oh, literally. Interesting. Yeah, because th that's when it becomes re very interesting when, like, uh, the process basically becomes your collaborator. Yeah, and and I'm I'm I'm. It's almost as if I'm designing an artificial intelligence <laughs> that I'm then letting, you know, then that artificial intelligence that's my musical partner then writes the piece of music. Okay, so have you been able to do this? Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, I did that on on several occasions. Like there, are like a handful of compositions out there that were done that way. Yeah, and That's also when I'm working with audio, um, I'm, I'm using feedback loops. So mm -hmm. you always get a little bit of that element of mm -hmm. recursion, right. even even in the audio processing I'm right. doing. Right. Like this little bit of looping I did last night, for example. Mm -hmm. Those were already feedback right. loops. You know. I. I I can't say that I've done that, but I, I believe I understand what you're saying. I, I actually, um, there's this guy Wolfram who has this. Uh, S Stephen Wolfram was this like mathematical genius apparently, and he created this Mathematica program. And um, so I went to this website about this was years and years ago, and he had a little music generator there, you know, and you could tweak it and this kind of stuff. And I'm like, okay, in and of itself, this is not interesting, mm -hmm. but when you take it. And what was cool about it was you could say, okay, kind of, here's my inputs, and it would spit out a file. It would spit out a MIDI file. Yeah. And then I could take that, and I was like, okay, I really like these parts of it, and throw out the rest. And, I, and, and it felt very interactive in a weird way. You know, like, okay, I'm... I'm no, that's exactly what I'm doing, except for the fact that I'm not editing the yeah, things less that, editing. I don't, that I don't like, less editing. Less yeah. editing. <laughs> because okay. that, that's where the beauty lies, in, yeah. in the things that I don't like, yeah. in, in, in the sounds that surprise me. So, I, I mean, if you, want to add, if you want to edit, just get rid of all, of all the stuff you like and only keep the stuff you don't like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean that, I, you know, that right. would be my approach because, right. because I want to find the new sounds. Mm -hmm. And the new is, I mean, really, if you think about it, if we say we like something, why do we say that? Because we know it. You know, I've never actually asked I, and answered that question. I, I, I believe a big part, I mean, not hard, no, but a big part is that we, we like the things that we know. Well, there's another side of it too, though. We also like novelty, <coughs> right? And, I mean, I know for myself, I've heard a lot of music over many, many years, and there is truth to what you're saying. I, I know this, and I like it. But there's also like, well, okay, I've heard enough of that. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know? So there, there's also this kind of desire for novelty that, that can, can drive you in perhaps interesting places. Of course. If, you know, if you still, still remember, like when you played um, 
in the C blues and mm. you ended on a C sharp <laughs> with your solo. Uh -huh. Yeah, and it made you cringe. You know, at that time it felt wrong, but then, you know, at some point you, you start learning to accept right. what sounds wrong in the first place and it becomes part of, and that's what I mean with, with less editing. Mm -hmm. Like the, the more experience you get, the more you can accept sounds Oh yeah. That that yeah. like maybe some people don't expect, some people don't like, but you can learn to like them. Right. You can learn to accept them. And that's what I mean. Like when I'm when I'm having a um, like an algorithm or a computer software write a piece of music for me with me, and mm -hmm. it's 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 my algorithm, so it's me. Right. Anyway, um, then I'm trying to keep the like the decisions that it's making that are kind of odd. Those are the ones that are kind of of interest. Mm -hmm. Because that's what I'm looking for. I'm not l not looking for those patterns that I that I could have played myself, or those patterns that I would have wri written down myself. You know, that's and that's kind of what why why I'm using um, software algorithms in the first place. But uh, okay, but uh, just to challenge that a little bit, because I, I I do understand what you're saying, but I also think that you must have some kind of Edit. You can't just accept that randomness, for the sake of <coughs> randomness, is going to have beauty. It may or may not. Yeah. Right. And I totally agree with you because randomness does not work for me at right. all. So like if a structure, if a structure happens that surprises me, it comes from some deterministic processes. It's never. It's okay. not. It's not random. Yeah. Okay. And that. That's why I can accept the beauty of it. Like okay. for example, I experimented a lot with um, with aleatory composition, mm -hmm. and I can use it um, well if I, you know, during a compositional process. Can you explain that again? Because I'm familiar with the term, but I it's it's just like 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 uh, rolling dice, for example. Okay. So so you have rolling dice, and the one is a C, and the two is a C sharp, and so on, okay. for example. Okay. And you can easily you know roll the dice and make a melody. Mm -hmm. You can do the same with with right. note lengths and. You know, sure. So and it's it's it is possible to um, to create beautiful work like that, um, but only if it's if it's if it's part of the human process. Mm -hmm. There's some intention or direction there, but it's not. It's like you're you're making the choice to use the dice, mm -hmm. and that's that's already <laughs> enough to make it work. Uh -huh. But if the dice were rolling by themselves, it doesn't make any sense. So for example, there are like. Um, like people who take like the uh, the data from the height of the of the ops mm -hmm. and and like you know that they right. put these numbers into and then turn that into a score for me that doesn't make sense right because that's not it's 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 that's random right that's random data but if if the data has like has like a detent intention or like if you um, if you were assigning meaning to the height of the mountains. You were saying, okay, back then people took this route, they went from there to there, there to there, and then that order, uh -huh. you put the heights, you know, mm -hmm. then it kind of starts making more sense. Oh, that's because you, and I think so, that's what I mean. You always have to have the human factor, you have to have the, the, um, the uh, you always have to build a story mm -hmm. somehow around what you're using in order for it to start making sense. Oh, that's fascinating. And the way that that translates to my the way that I compose algorithmically is that I don't use single pitches as the as the smallest unit. The smallest unit for my compositional technique is an interval. So it's already a relationship. Mm -hmm. So if you're taking a relationship of two pitches, that has meaning, and these can be turned into a series and can be turned into used for an algorithm. Mm -hmm. But if you just have individual notes. Um, it's much harder to, to, to create something truly musical from it. Right. So 12-tone composition, for example, if you just, if you just take uh, the 12-tone series and you write a melody with that, it's just the 12 notes repeated over and over again right. in, in a fixed sequence. But if you start composing polyphonically with it, then it starts getting into different sorts mm -hmm. of relationships mm -hmm. and it becomes music, you know? 
so and and it, it took me it took me a while to figure that out um, yeah I mean I have a long history of kind of ex experimenting with uh, generative music yeah wow so, that's cool yeah I think it can lead somewhere very um, well, I, I think it's actually largely untapped still. I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. And and part of... <coughs> you know, I, I do want to touch on this because it, it, I, I this is another one of these things that I, I have so many things in my life where I'm like, yes, but no, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, kind of thing. And um, one of them is um, is actually this very topic, right? Um, because they're, you know, you, you read these stupid um, research papers, you know, these guys at MIT invented this program that plays Bach, mm -hmm. you know, or something mm -hmm. insane, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it's like, and then all of a sudden there's like a news article on it, yes. you know, and, and, and I'm just like, this is yeah. just madness, you know? It's ridiculous. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it has nothing to do with what we were just talking no. about. No, it has nothing to do with that. But it's lumped in the same category to many people. So anyhow, it's just funny. Yeah, but it's just just the same. I think the people who who go on to that quest to find uh, a way to recreate Bach's music by building neural networks or right. whatever that learn the structures and then can repeat them. It's fine. It's great. It's great. But their interest is in recreating an existing sound, just like the blues. Mm -hmm people that I mentioned earlier, right. they want to learn to play the blues just like player X. Right. Yeah. And that's that's fine, that's great. But my process is that I want to find a new sound. Mm -hmm. So that means I have to I have to train the uh, the neural network with something that doesn't exist yet. If you're thinking in the in, in the same terms. So and then the question is is the neural network the right tool? No, it's not. Right. Because I have basically have to create my own rules that make the music that then later on maybe somebody can analyze and try to understand what's happening. <laughs> so, like, like I was, I was thinking, I have this huge uh, orchestral piece, which is a generative piece, uh, algorithmic piece called Todd Morton 513, and it's it's a really fucking complex composition that's based on a really elaborate process, which involves a lot of computer made decisions but also quite a few decisions I made mm -hmm. so I was thinking what would happen if at some date in the future like maybe a class at some conservatory sits down and analyzes this piece of music what right. will they discover right will they have un any understanding of the processes that I used probably not no but they will find something that I have no idea was actually in the piece right you know is it right is it wrong who knows They'll find something, though. Yeah. But I am curious. What so? What applications are you using to do this? What um, do you work with? Well, it's it's mostly. Well, these days it's uh, Ableton Live. Okay. Which I used to um, to create generative MIDI. And it stuff. allows you to do that. It allows you to do that. Okay, I, I have to look into that. That's really fascinating. Yeah. But I've I've also got a um, programmer friend uh, up in Boston mm -hmm. who helps me um, who helped me recreate an old. Uh, piece of software that I've I've written when I was still like 15. Really? Yeah, which was a very simple, just a recur recursive procedure that um, creates a just a recursive interval structure. Right. And he's helped me recreate that, and we've modified that with all my current knowledge. And there are all these things um, that cycling 74. Those guys. Yes. They have a lot of that. That environment is something you could bring some of that into I think. Oh yes. And a lot of people are working with that. Yeah. Um, but I at this point, you know, maybe if I if I was to learn uh, Max MSP, mm. I, I'm I'm sure I could do great things with it. But at this point I well, feel like it's um, Well if you have an avenue that, that you're comfortable with or, or that you think is interesting, go there. Right? No, I mean I like my, my, my friend Tobias uh, Tobias Weber who is in my band Central Zone also. He is, he's a great pro Max MSP uh, programmer. So mm -hmm. basically, whenever I would need anything, I could only would have to ask him, and he would program it. That's cool. So like like sometimes like after after the most recent tour, I sent him an email 
saying, hey, I had this idea, we, it would be great to have this and this. Uh, like what we wanted to do, for example, is like a, a filter tool, filtering tool, that a scale filter tool mm -hmm. that does not shut nodes off that are not in the scale, but where you can dynamically change things. So you could, for example, say, okay, this um, um, scale filter in C major, C mm -hmm. major, white keys. Um, so, but at the white keys are going to be at maximum level, and all the black keys at half level. Mm -hmm. So just imagine, then you you have you send like random nodes into that, and you kind of crossfade from. You can crossfade from the one scale to the other dynamically, yeah. Yeah. and you can create like waves or, or, or moving moving waves of harmonies by morphing from one harmony into the other that way and and stuff like that like I've always had I've okay always so had when you go there when you yeah. do that stuff do you see that as a an end in itself or is that a foundation for no, that it's never, to explore no it's not it's never an end in itself yeah no it's always like the end is the discovery of a new sound and quite often I, I have this idea for for a musical tool, mm -hmm. um, and I try it, and it sounds shit, and then I'm not going to use it. I'm not ever going to use it. Mm -hmm. Actually, my very first experiment with uh, generative music was I took a Lewis Carroll poem, and I turned it into uh, the ASCII data and turned those into MIDI notes, <laughs> and I listened to it. And even though it was like uh, back then, I had I had just uh, read uh, Gödel Escherbach, mm -hmm. you know, and and I wanted to like have this is what he called isomorphic translation so you have the same information but uh, coded into a new medium mm -hmm. and so so listening back to that poem as sounds sounded horrible it didn't work <laughs> didn't work you know there's basically the same information you could could right. decode the sound right. to give you that poem back but it does not it doesn't have any meaning in a different right. medium and that's when i realized just to work with individual pitches doesn't work because those individual pitches don't suggest an actual relationship to something. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, just putting a drone under that poem would probably have made it sound better. Right. Because then there, then there is a musical relationship. But just this one process that I thought would be sounding interesting was crap. Oh, that's and that's why I never used anything like that anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah.